Okay, so it's 12.05, so maybe um, we can get rolling uh, with the topic for today, geriatric nephrology, and thanks to Dr. Liu, uh, who has uh, is one of our most recent additions to our geriatrics division as uh, we continue to grow and spread across all three sites. So thanks for taking the time to prepare the talk for us yeah. today. Of course. Okay, so I will get started. Uh, my name is Aizen. Uh, to everyone who doesn't know me, um, like Dr. Gordon said, I'm one of the newest members in the Division of Geriatric Medicine, and I'm excited to be talking about geriatric nephrology today. Um, it's kind of one of the more up-and-coming niche sub-sub-specialties of geriatric medicine. Um, and part of the inspiration for the talk today is as we're growing our geriatric medicine consultation service, we're starting to see more and more consults com coming from the nephrology department, specifically at the general site. And so I wanted to take the opportunity to uh, take a deeper dive into the field of geriatric nephrology and to share some of my findings with you today. So, Okay, so this is an overview of what we will be covering today. I wanted to talk a little bit about why geriatric nephrology might be important. I wanted to explore some of the geriatric giants um, and its relationship in nephrology. So looking at kidney disease and cognition, falls and frailty, um, some of the common themes and topics we commonly look at in geriatric medicine. And then finally, to take a look at um, some guidelines or suggestions to how to manage these frailer older adults in, um, in, in nephrology once they reach CKD and ESRD stage, and if there are other options out there. Okay, so this is a table I uh, took from the core data, so Canadian Organ Replacement Register in 2021. It includes data from 2001 to 2020, so two decades of data excluding Quebec, however. It basically looks at the prevalence of end-stage kidney disease and arranged by age group. I've highlighted the table um, to look at ESRD in rate per million population rather than looking at the absolute numbers. And as you can see in the age 75 and above range, um, the prevalence of ESRD is quite high compared to a younger population, which probably doesn't come as a surprise to everyone. And uh, looking at it a little bit closer, over the past two decades, there is clearly a trend to increase in prevalence of ESRD, again, specifically more so in the older adults um, population compared to younger adults, um, looking at these numbers here. And so um, with geriatric patients who have uh, CKD or ESRD, they do also come with many geriatric syndromes, which again is probably not a surprise. This is a particular study that looked at ESRD patients with a mean age of 78. MCM here uh, in graph B stands for maximum conservative, conservative management. But in any case, um, with these ESRD patients, um, they looked at uh, they completed a comprehensive geriatric assessment, so those big long notes that you've probably seen from us in the past, and they assessed many, many domains, including cognitive impairment, mood, malnutrition, um, IEDLs, ADLs, so functional impairments, um, comorbidities, recent falls, polypharmacy, all of these factors. And um, as you can see from this graph here, most patients have more than one of these geriatric syndromes. <coughs> okay. Um, and so what do these geriatric syndromes lead to and what do they mean? Um, we can pull from other studies, older studies in all older adults in general, um, there is a consistency where decreased functional performance, cognitive decline, depression, immobility are all associated with early mortality and free more frequent hospitalizations. Looking specifically at the ESRD patients, uh, frailty is associated with worse quality of life, irrespective of whether or not they are on dialysis or conservative management. <coughs> 
and for patients starting on dialysis, uh, it's been found that frailty, malnutrition, functional dependency, cognitive impairment, depressive symptoms are all um, uh, associated with increased mortality, um, as well as longer lengths of stay. So identifying these geriatric syndromes can help direct treatment plans early on and can address some of these uh, issues or reversible causes. <coughs> okay, so I wanted to move on to some specific geriatric giants and how they play a role in nephrology. So let's take a look at cognition first. So in terms of cognitive impairment, it is quite prevalent in the CKD population. Um, so this is the population of patients who are not yet on dialysis or who are not yet in the ESRD range. In a Canadian study, Canadian data from 2016, more than 60% had cognitive impairment in CKD ranges, stages G4 to G5. Uh, and it's generally thought to be a graded relationship between the severity of CKD and cognitive impairment, as you can see from um, this diagram here, the lower your, GF, your GFR is, um, the lower it's correlated with a lower MMSC score. Um, now, even in this Canadian data, they did comment on um, that the 60% is thought to be an underestimate because patients with known dementia were actually excluded from this data. Um, we also know that CKD is an independent risk factor for cognitive impairment in and of itself. So with a creatinine doubling from 80 to about 177, there is an associated risk of 26% uh, of increased risk for dementia. And then finally, we studies have also shown that the rate of cognitive decline is also associated with uh, lower EGFRs. Um, and so what about in the ESRD and hemodialysis population? The data is quite similar here as well. It's estimated at about 30 to 60 percent um, of prevalence of cognitive impairment in the ESRD population. Um, and that's at least two times that of age match controls. Again, likely underestimated as these early studies only evaluated MMSC or 3MS, which are pretty limited in terms of its sensitivities for detecting cognitive impairment. Um, in subsequent more recent studies, they found that normal MMSCs does not preclude cognitive impairment in the hemodialysis or ESRD population, um, and that in subgroups where they performed quote unquote normal on MMSC, so greater or equal to 24, um, there were still significant um, changes in terms of specifically executive function, which we'll talk about in more in a second. Um, and then when testing was done on more detailed neuro neuropsychological battery, um, it was found that the prevalence for cognitive impairment anywhere ranging from MCI to severe cognitive impairment was as high as 87% in this population. More interestingly, um, there's also been some evidence to show that there's some variability in cognitive function uh, during the course of dialysis. So cognitive changes tend to, or cognit cognition tends to be worse during the session. And um, some evidence to show that it is best shortly after the session or the day after dialysis. Um, and so I wanted to take a little look uh, into some of more objective changes to try to help explain why cognitive impairment is so prevalent in the CKD SRD population. Now, brain imaging studies in CKD patients do show higher prevalence of stroke and subclinical CVD compared to the, your normal non-CKD population. Stroke incidence annually for hemodialysis patients is about 15% compared to about 10% in CKD and compared to about 2.4% in non-CKD population. There's also evidence to show increased subclinical cerebrovascular disease. So things like silent strokes or white matter disease, which is more prevalent in hemodialysis patients about five times higher than the non-CKD cohort. <coughs> The prevalence of these silent infarcts is found to be an inversely proportional to your kidney function, so more in lower kidney functions. Um, 
kind of alluding to what I was saying earlier, during dialysis, brain imaging studies also show decreased cerebral perfusion compared to before these dialysis sessions. Um, this is an image from one of these studies uh, that compared patients on dialysis on the left-hand side a year prior versus a year later. Um, and as you can see here, there's increases in these small periventricular white matter disease changes and deepening of the sulci atrophy, particularly in the frontal, parietal, and temporal lobes. Okay, so then trying to tie this all together, knowing what we know from the brain imaging findings, um, Cognitive impairment, of course, it, it, in CKD, it's thought to be multifactorial, um, a multifactorial process that leads to cognitive impairment. From this diagram, you can see there's many different factors, including stroke and small vessel disease, but also hypertension, depression, sleep disorders, uremia, neuroinflammation, dialysis specific factors as well. Um, but the most sort of prevalent theory on why uh, cognitive impairment is so prevalent in CKD is because of vascular change and vascular damage. Now, drawing from previous studies in cardiovascular health studies, um, we do know that white matter disease, things like silent strokes, are associated with deficits in uh, subcortical function. So things like executive function, processing speed, rather than in memory changes. And this is similar to what we see in the dialysis population. So all of these vascular changes that we see leads essentially to more of an executive dysfunction picture in uh, patients with CKD, with kidney disease. Now, executive function is a, a set of complex cognitive behaviors that drive goal-oriented behavior. Um, so things like your uh, ability to think flexibly, your planning, your organization, your ability to initiate a task, impulse control. Um, in CKD, um, it, sorry, in CKD patients transitioning to dialysis and in patients with on hemodialysis compared to healthy controls, um, it's been found that their executive function is more affected than some of the other cortical functions such as uh, memory impairment. <laughs> um, and having vascular risk factors um, like MIs, PVDs, strokes um, are increased or associated with even lower executive dysfunction. And these findings were again sustained in patients with uh, quote unquote, a normal MS, MMSE. Um, and so hopefully up until this point, I've convinced you that cognitive impairment is quite prevalent in kidney disease, but what does this all translate to? What does this mean? And what are some of the outcomes of cognitive impairment? So, um, in this particular study, the cognitive HD study, they looked at cognitive impairment and mortality in hemodialysis patients. And more cognitive impairment is associated with higher mortality is what they found. So in this particular study, they tested all five different domains, including executive function, but also memory, attention, language, perceptual motor, via a very um, comprehensive neuropsychiatric testing. They found that patients on hemodialysis there was increased risk for mortality compared to, uh, sorry, increased risk of mortality in patients with any cognitive impairment compared to those without cognitive impairment. Um, and when you look at this a, a little bit further, those with more numbers of domains impaired, more numbers of cognitive domains impaired, that was in associated with an even higher um, mortality risk compared to those with fewer cognitive domains impaired. Um, so that was in patients with cognitive impairments, but not specifically a diagnosis of dementia. But in the dementia population, looking specifically at patients with a diagnosis, Alzheimer's or otherwise, uh, the same holds true. And so in this particular study, we see that the overall mortality risk um, in patients on hemodialysis 
uh, is higher in patients with dementia, Alzheimer's and in Alzheimer's disease in, in particular. Other outcomes that are associated with cognitive impairment um, includes increased withdrawals from dialysis. So starting uh, patients with dementia on dialysis actually showed more withdrawals from dialysis compared to those without dementia. And I don't have a, a, a nice graph to show to demonstrate this, but lower MMSC scores were also associated with increased hospitalization risk in this population. So how can we make things better? And if there's anything to make things better from a cognitive perspective, taking a look, a look at um, the effect of hemodialysis on the brain first. Um, when I looked at older studies, they actually, there was some indication, some signal to show that cognitive function after the initiation of dialysis did improve. But when you trend and follow these patients longitudinally after several years, the cognitive function actually begins to worsen. Um, the data I've shown here was from a meta-analysis in 2016, looking at cognition in patients with ESRD treated um, here with hemodialysis. So comparing the hemodialysis uh, patients versus the general population, we see that the cognition in HD patients did not return back to the normal level of their sort of pre-dialysis uh, comparators uh, across most domains. Um, but when comparing hemodialysis patients versus ESRD patients not treated on, on uh, hemodialysis, you could argue that they have performed a little bit better um, in certain domains. <clears throat> um, and then they also looked at hemodialysis uh, versus CKD population. So those in stages two to four <clears throat> CKD, um, and they perform quite similarly across, uh, across most domains. However, kind of alluding to what I was saying earlier, longitudinally, patients on hemodialysis do perform worse on cognitive testing uh, than patients not on hemodialysis. Okay, what about more HD? Um, so consistently across several studies, more hemodialysis does not, also does not seem to improve cognition. So one study looked at hemodialysis um, six times a week versus three times a week, and this did not improve cognitive function when they looked at both executive function or global cognition in general. Um, and a different study found that dialysis adequacy as measured by KT over B also did not correlate with better cognitive performance. And what about cognitive function during dialysis? Again, uh, it's been shown that intradialytic uh, cognitive decline um, or cogni cognitive function seems to be worse um, compared to shortly before the session and on the day after. Um, this graph just shows a transcranial ultra, a Doppler ultrasound measuring the cerebral arterial mean flow velocity during hemodialysis, and that seems to drop during hemodialysis up to about 30 minutes post. So overall, more hemodialysis does not seem to make cognition better, either in the long run or during dialysis sessions, but what about other options? So looking into the transplant data and possibly peritoneal dialysis, it does appear a little more promising. So transplant seems to improve cognitive function um, from several studies. So one particular study looked at a 12-month follow-up in patients who transitioned from hemodialysis to uh, receiving a renal transplant, and they found that um, they had significantly improved executive function as well as memory impairments. This does not seem to be progression in white matter disease after receiving a transplant. And um, there's some data to suggest uh, possible cognitive improvement to a level no different from healthy controls after receiving a transplant. Um, the data with 
peritoneal dialysis is a little more sparse, um, generally with uh, conducted in smaller cohorts. Um, and previous meta-analyses said they could not conclude the difference between peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis in terms of cognitive improvement. But some studies do show that 12 months follow-up patients on peritoneal dialysis did show some improvements in executive function and complex attention compared to those on HD. But probably more studies are, would be needed in this, um, in this context. Okay, so that's kind of all I wanted to talk about in terms of the cognitive piece. Um, but some take home points are that CKD and ASRD are certainly associated with worsening cognition and increased risk for cognitive impairment, likely all mediated, not all, likely mostly mediated by vascular uh, pathogenesis pathology, leading to more of an executive dysfunction picture. Um, and that hemodialysis un is unlikely to improve cognitive function, but perhaps renal transplant and peritoneal dialysis are correlated to more improvements in cognitive function. Um, moving on to sort of an overview looking at kidney disease and its relationship with falls. We also see a high prevalence of falls in patients with kidney disease. In the hemodialysis patient population, 28% of patients fell annually, which is a two time, um, uh, sorry, with two time increased risk of falls um, if they are found to be frail or have depressed mood. Um, and in particular, in the dialysis initiation period, as you can see from this uh, graph here, that's where um, the higher risk of falls seems to, to lie. Similarly, in CKD patients, um, it's been found that there's a 2.3 times increase risk of falls compared to the non-CKD population, and about 1.5 times more likely for them to sustain a falls-related injury compared to the non-CKD population. <laughs> Um, some risk factors for falls in CKD um, include polypharmacy, having dementia, being significantly frail, having depression, older age, having orthostatic hypotension, or uh, like I mentioned, new hemodialysis start. Uh, a lot of these factors are things we do screen in a comprehensive geriatric assessment and are things that we do address, and some of it being uh, modifiable. Some interventions to reduce falls in dialysis patients. Number one, exercise, 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 probably the most important thing to implement. Um, we know that low physical activity and poor physical performance are strongly associated with all cause mortality in addition to falls, um, as illustrated by this graph here. Um, which looked at patients with CKD stages one to four and their gait speed. So uh, above or below 0.8 meters per second, you can see that patients with um, a better, faster gait speed did better. Um, multifactorial false prevention strategies uh, in a clinical or inpatient setting have also been found to reduce risk of falls in dialysis patients. Again, stressing exercise, physical therapy and rehabilitation, but also medication review to address polypharmacy, as well as patient and staff education. Okay, so some take home points um, from this fall section is that falls can be prevalent in the transition period to hemodialysis, and it might be beneficial to screen for falls during that period to see if there are any modifiable risk factors that we could address, um, and of course, to encourage exercise. Okay, and finally, moving on to kidney disease and frailty. So frailty itself um, is a syndrome of increased vulnerability. Um, it reflects a state of vulnerability to numerous adverse events resulting from decreased physiologic reserve, um, which is a combination of both physical and psychosocial components. Frailty is dynamic and it can improve or worsen over time. This is probably a, a common diagram, a common thing you see in geriatric medicine um, with things like delirium, but 
applies to frailty as well. So those who are more severely frail after experiencing a external stressor, they are more uh, likely to be functionally dependent, have poor outcomes, and uh, more likely to return to their previous baseline. There are um, a few different models of frailty out there. Um, I've put two up, um, which are probably more known and more used. The first one being Freud's frailty phenotype, um, which is more used in a research setting because it's quite difficult to operationalize in a clinical setting, but it does look at five dif different domains, weakness as measured by grip strength, um, walking speed, physical low, low levels of physical activity, self-reported fatigue or exhaustion or unintentional weight loss, um, but again, quite difficult to operationalize um, in a clinical setting. And so Rockwood's clinical frailty scale is probably what is used more. <clears throat> and you can characterize frailty just by looking at a patient's uh, functional history and functional status. Again, I wanted to start about with talking about the prevalence of frailty in kidney disease. Um, and there's been multiple studies looking at this throughout uh, the, the course of CKD into the dialysis patient. So in the CKD population using Freed's frailty phenotype, patients aged 65 with CKD were 15% frail versus 6% in the non-CKD matched cohort. In the ESRD population, systematic reviews have found greater than one third of patients were frail. And in the dialysis patient, similarly, um, frailty uh, is increased and though data suggests it can be quite variable <clears throat> between 30 to 73% based on Freed's uh, frailty criteria. <clears throat> so again, let's look at some of the outcomes with frailty and kidney disease and why it may be important. So frailty um, has been found to increased mortality in ESRD and in dialysis uh, patients. Um, some risk factors for increased frailty in ESRD patients include age, diabetes, being female, uh, and being on hemodialysis compared to peritoneal dialysis. This graph is taken from a, a single center study conducted in the US in looking at hemodialysis patients. Um, they characterize patients who were newly started on hemodialysis and categorized them into non-frail or intermediate, intermediately frail or severely frail. And as you can see, um, following them for three years mortality was about 40% in uh, the frail dialysis patients and about 16% in the non-frail patients. Frailty also leads to increased hospitalizations um, <coughs> in, <coughs> again, the dialysis, sorry, in the dialysis population, um, I, as demonstrated by this graph. Again, similar to previous, they characterize patients based on their frailty status, not frail versus intermediately frail versus significantly frail, and hospitalization rates, again, were highest in those who were the most frail. There are other outcomes uh, associated with frailty, including increased cognitive decline, increased complications such as vascular access failure, <clears throat> increased depression, and decreased quality of life, many of which are quite important to the, the older adult population that we look at. And so what is the effect um, on, on frailty or function after dialysis initiation? Now we know that physical performance and functional status are known to decline in the hemodialysis population, especially in older adults. However, there's been limited studies in evaluating frailty after dialysis initiation. However, there's been some studies that looked at loss of functional status and loss of independence as a sort of a surrogate marker for frailty. 
Um, this particular study was done in long-term care patients, um, as you can imagine, already quite frail at baseline, but they looked at patients initiating on dialysis. Uh, uh, at three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months. And by 12 months after dia dialysis initiation, only about 13% maintained their pre-dialysis functional levels, as shown in this sort of medium blue bar. <clears throat> um, and another study looked at the effect on function and independence after dialysis initiation in independent older adults who were living on their own. Um, this was a study published in Nedgem in 2009. It looked at patients over the age of 80 on dialysis and looked at their loss of independence and function over the period of uh, two years. <clears throat> the graph is a bit convoluted, but I will draw your attention to this dark blue bar, which represent patients who are independent and who are alive at the beginning of the study. And you can see this dark blue bar tends to shrink down and does shrink down towards the end of the follow-up period. Um, at the time of dialysis initiation, 70 six or 78 percent of the cohort were independent so meaning they were living at home with no assistance with their ADLs and after about a year um, this has decreased to 22 percent with the remainder admitted to either assisted living long-term care or had submitted applications for caregiver support or had died and this dark blue bar again shrinks at, at the end of the follow-up period following that same pattern and so dialysis, it seems, does not improve or maintain functional independence, which again is one of the bigger concerns in our frailer older adult population. Um, and so the question is, is there something else we can do differently to help with frailty in, in these older, frailer patients? Um, this is an approach um, uh, to caring for frail or older adults uh, and patients with CKD. And there are sort of this, this comprehensive method to look to looking at these patients, similar to what we would do when conducting a comprehensive geriatric assessment. We will look at them holistically, doing a medication review, false prevention measures, talking about advanced care planning ahead of time, looking at their nutritional status, um, considering causes for reduced appetite, having dietary uh, measures reassessed, um, of course, optimizing their complications for CKD, having an individualized exercise training programs, <coughs> which benefits all stages of CKD to improve muscle strength, cardiovascular health, and quality of life. And of course, having a shared decision-making with the patients regarding the appropriateness of uh, renal replacement therapy. Um, in the 2012 American Society of Nephrology, Quality, and Patient Safety Task Force, they did recommend to not initiate chronic chemodialysis without ensuring a shared decision-making process between patients, families, and their physicians. And older studies do show um, that fewer than 10% of patients followed by a nephrologist for CKD reported having a discussion regarding end-of-life uh, care issues. Um, though I do suspect that this number has changed and has improved over the years. <clears throat> However, also drive home the point that having a discussion and conversation with our frailer older adults um, about whether or not renal replacement therapy would be a good option for them upfront um, would be uh, a good idea. And that dialysis may not be the only path uh, out there to take. Um, you can consider things like home hemodialysis uh, versus in-center hemodialysis. You can consider involving palliative care earlier on. You can also consider active medical management um, or conservative management with, without dialysis or considering a time-limited trial of dialysis as long as it's meeting the patient's goals. So using this goals and pause point uh, method in, in those who do choose a dialysis pathway, 
<laughs> and the goal is so patients don't miss an opportunity for a timely discussion of prognosis and advanced care planning uh, and what dialysis might mean to them. Um, this particular uh, paper looked at, um, oh, this particular paper looked at um, uh, a pathway in having these conversations with patients in terms of defining their goals up front, so meaningful objectives for the patients and what they hope to accomplish. Um, some examples were spend time with the family, be active enough to not need long-term care or to get stronger and to continue being independent at home. Um, it might be worthwhile to do a time-limited trial of dialysis as long as patients are meeting their goals um, <coughs> um, and to review this from time to time. And of course, identifying pause points or identifying conditions and setbacks where patients would um, then identify that dialysis may not be acceptable within their goals of care. Um, and finally, uh, I just wanted to share some, some other guidelines um, or different options out there. This one particular from BC Renal Agency in sharing, conservative, in sharing the conservative management pathway for patients with advanced kidney disease. Again, uh, just to share that there are other options um, out there other than hemodialysis and having this conversation with our patients who are frailer and older with cognitive impairment upfront um, would be the key. Okay, that brings me to the end of my talk. So some final thoughts and take home points. Um, screening for frailty, cognitive impairment, falls, and older patients with CKD would be beneficial to identify some of these um, reversible uh, etiologies or uh, to add a geriatric lens. And having early discussions on goals of care um, <clears throat> and talking about other options to managing uh, ESRD would also be appropriate. Okay, and that is the end, the end of my talk. Happy for uh, any discussions, comments, questions. Thanks, Aizen, for that very thoughtful talk. Um, I'll just have a peek, we'll open the chat if anybody has any questions. Not sure if Denise uh, is on this call, but I think, you know, looking at some of the uh, content towards the end, uh, the BC Renal Agency pathway, I think that was really helpful in thinking about, you know, how we proactively manage some of our patients, again, like frail patients with lots of comorbidities, potentially some cognitive impairment as they're reaching kind of the peridialysis period. I know we do have our conservative care clinic and, um, it, yeah, it's a, a a good point as we review kind of what our current status is because we do have that that clinic in place. I don't know if anyone from Nephro is able to speak to that as well. Certainly, think it's an area you know, that will continue to have focus as we've been expanding both our geriatrics and our palliative care divisions and um, our health human resources are improving. Um, so if uh, no other questions, thanks again so much for the talk and I uh, hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.